Hello, sixth graders. Mr. Drain here with you again for our fourth lesson together. We're starting to skip around a little bit in our textbooks. So even though this is our fourth lesson, we're covering what is chapter five in your textbook, the material uh, called How to Use the Bible. So this is a little bit more of a, a sort of um, main principles for accessing the scriptures in the Bible and a kind of how-to video. So we're going to get a little bit more practical today than, than we have in the past. Um, you really need a copy of the scriptures. So whatever copy of the Bible you've got sitting around your house would be great. You see here, I've got a copy of um, uh, Ignatius Press's version of the Holy Bible, which says on the side, uh, Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition. Um, and it's the Holy Bible, so it's got all of the Old Testament and the New Testament together, right? So grab that with you. Uh, you'll see I also have um, some fancy organizational tabs, which, uh, let me get that close up to the camera. It has abbreviations for all the books of the Bible. These, these are kind of pro tools for accessing the scriptural texts. I use this because I frequently use this Bible to teach, so I need to have quick access to these things. Okay, so make sure you've got your workbook, uh, copy of the Bible, and something to write with. So let's begin with our prayer for this session. <clears throat> and please repeat after me for uh, this first part. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so to begin this lesson, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from the book the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And I'm going to ask you some questions about the book. So here's a selection from The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which got turned into a movie, The Wizard of Oz. Here's a selection from the book. We cannot be far from the road of yellow brick now, remarked the scarecrow as he stood beside the girl, for we have come nearly as far as the river carried us away. The tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl and turning his head, which worked beautifully on hinges, he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass toward them. It was indeed a great yellow wildcat, and the woodman thought it must be chasing something, for its ears were lying close to its head and its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the tin woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse. And although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wildcat to try to kill such a pretty, harmless creature. Okay, now I'm going to ask you some questions about that selection. Who are the main characters in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz? According to this excerpt, so just from what we've heard, who are the main characters? They mentioned a girl, the scarecrow, and the tin woodman. Now they mentioned those characters. These aren't necessarily all the main characters. And in fact, they might not even be the main characters at all. There's not enough information to tell. How did the characters in that excerpt come to that particular moment in the story? There's a hint that maybe they got washed there by a river, but we don't know that part of the story. We've jumped in from nowhere, right? How did the story begin according to this excerpt? We have no idea. We have no clue. We don't have enough information. How does the story end? We also don't know. We just grabbed a random episode from the middle. According to this excerpt, what was the author's intention for writing The Wonderful Wizard of Oz? You could guess that maybe it's a story about a girl, a scarecrow, and a tin woodsman, or simply that he wants to tell a fantasy story. But the reality is that we don't have enough information to figure out the author's intention, or even the point of the story. Now, according to this excerpt, how does Harry Potter defeat Lord Voldemort? Whoa, 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 what? Harry Potter with the Wizard of Oz? What am I talking about? Right. You should be confused by that question. The correct answer is that we don't know. In fact, that's the wrong question to be asking about this excerpt or book, since the Harry Potter characters don't even appear in this book. Now, why do this in order to, to talk about how we use the Bible? 
would we be able to learn the answer to any of these questions if we read an equally random excerpt from another section of the book? Probably not. Only if we read from the very beginning would we know how it begins, and only if we read the very end would we know how it ends. We don't even know if those were the main characters we were dealing with, right? The girl wasn't even named, for example. What would we need to do to answer these and other questions about the book? We'd have to read the entire thing. We'd have to read the whole thing, right? For many people, if they've ever tried to read the Bible, the experience is like this exercise of reading a random excerpt from The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Most people pick a random place in the Bible and start reading, expecting it to make complete sense. Sometimes they even ask wrong questions about what they are reading, hoping to find an answer where there is none, like asking about the ending of Harry Potter when it's a totally wrong story, right? Ultimately, to read the Bible effectively, we must first know how to read it. The Bible is unlike any book that has ever been written. With The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, you can simply start at the beginning and read to the end and get the complete story. Not so with the Bible. The Bible is more accurately understood as a library of books rather than a single book to be read from cover to cover. In fact, the word Bible comes from the Latin word biblia, ta biblia, which means a collection of books, right? Therefore, in order to find answers to the right questions about the Bible, we have to know how to read it properly, right? It's not like any other book. And therefore, it's got its own rules that have to be obeyed to actually understand it, right? So, an example on how to find things in the Bible using common abbreviations. So, our example is, is this set of uh, this name, John, and this set of numbers. So, I'm going to teach you how to look at a typical passage in the Bible. So written this way, John 3 with a colon, and then two numbers separated by a hyphen. That's a typical way a passage in the Bible is referenced. Using this notation, we can look up the specific book, John, the specific chapter, 3, and the specific verses. So written this way, we're looking at the 16th and 17th verses of the third chapter of the book uh, of the Gospel of John. That's the typical way a passage in the Bible is referenced. The book is listed first, and then the chapter, and then the verses. So it starts general and gets specific, right? In the example above, the book is John, chapter is three, the verses are 16 and 17. Now, sometimes the name of the book is abbreviated. This is often the case in Bibles themselves, too. For example, the Gospel of John is sometimes abbreviated just JN, period. The book of Genesis is sometimes abbreviated GN, period, right? Now, I'm going to put your knowledge to the test. Turn to pages 20 and 21 in your workbooks. I want you to go through this Bible scavenger hunt, okay? So with your scripture next to you, let's look at page 21 first. <clears throat> so label the book chapter and verses in the following reference. And it lists there Matthew 28 colon 16 to 20. So what is the book there? Matthew. What's the chapter? 28. And what are the verses? Verses 16 to 20. Typically a verse is a sentence or two, right? So it's about four sentences from the 28th chapter of Matthew's gospel, which if my memory serves correctly, is the resurrection account after the crucifixion. And just to test Mr. Drain's knowledge of the gospel according to Matthew, I'm going to look up Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and see what it is. Matthew 28, the, title, the chapter is titled The Resurrection of Jesus. Verses 16 to 20 is when Jesus commissions the disciples, which reads, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Okay, so I knew that. That's great. 
I want you to pause the video and work on question two yourselves, right? Which books of the Bible do the following abbreviations stand for? Okay. So uh, pause the video and work through that and then unpause it and I'll go over the answers real quick. Okay. So we're on page 20. We're looking at question two of part one. Which books of the Bible do the following abbreviations stand for? The first one, NM period. That's an abbreviation for the book of numbers. The second one, EZ period, is an abbreviation for the book of Ezekiel. EX is an abbreviation for Exodus. BAR, bar, is an abbreviation for Baruch. Baruch. That's a small book toward the, the back of the Old Testament. Likewise, uh, Jeremiah is next, right? Now we start adding numbers to some of these. So in, in the case of one SM period, there's two books of Samuel. So there's first Samuel and second Samuel, which we abbreviate with one SM like that. So, so first Samuel or one Samuel, you could write. MT, that's an abbreviation for Matthew. So the gospel according to Matthew. EPH. F. That's an abbreviation for St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. P-H-I-L, you're like, how is, how is the four-letter thing an abbreviation? That's an abbreviation for St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, right? And finally, N-E-H is an abbreviation for Nehemiah, N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H, -E Nehemiah. Okay, now still on page 20, I want you to work on part two, fill in the blank, yourself as well. So it gives you uh, the book and the chapter of the Bible. So it's telling you where to start going, and then it wants you to find a, the particular verse that it's got uh, blanks uh, featured there from. So it wants you to, for example, look at St. Paul's letter to the Romans and go to the 12th chapter, and then try to find real quick the verse that that's referencing. So do that for all four of these, fill in the blank, pause the video and work on that. Okay, so hopefully you filled in the blanks for each four of these. For Romans 12, I'll read through the whole sentence and you'll, you'll capture the answer if you couldn't find it. For as in one body, we have many parts and all the parts do not have the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. And depending on your Bible, the translation will vary a little bit there. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them. If, proper, if prophecy in proportion to the faith, if ministry in ministering, if one is a teacher in teaching. Okay, now Proverbs, which is in the Old Testament, chapter 3. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves as a father, the son he favors. Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, the very last uh, book of the New Testament, Revelation, or the sometimes it's called the Apocalypse, uh, according to John, or the Apocalypse to John, the Revelation to John, or just Apocalypse or Revelation, a couple different names it can be given. Typically, Catholics refer to it as the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 13, then I saw a beast come out of the sea with 10 horns and seven heads. On its horns were 10 diadems and on its heads, blasphemous names, okay? Now, again, thinking about that, you had to read through chapter 13, and you're probably like, what is going on, right? Now, Revelation, a lot's going on there. It's a mystical vision, a revelation to, uh, to St. John, apparently. Um, it's hard to understand even just reading all of Revelation on its own, but you're imagining, particularly, if all you see is this, this sentence from Revelation 13, you're like, what? Who in the Bible is seeing a dragon? What are, you got to read all of scripture to get a sense of what those symbols and images might mean, right? It doesn't make sense on its own, and it's not supposed to. Just like an excerpt from the Wizard of Oz isn't going to make a whole lot of sense on its own. Now, finally, the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Okay, now a final activity turning over to page 21, work on part three. Who said this? Look up the given verses in the Bible to determine who made the statements listed. You may need to look in the verses surrounding the given passage to figure it out. So this is like the final level of challenge here, okay? 
So um, you'll see the verse listed at the very end of the quotation, Acts chapter 9, verse 4, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, Matthew verse chapter 2, verse 8, Joshua chapter 6. Verse, okay, go through all those and try to answer who said it in those parts. All right, I'm going to go over the answers to this. So who said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus. Who said, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne with the train of his garment filling the temple? Isaiah said that. Who said, go and search diligently for the child? When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. King Herod said that. Who said, now shout, for the Lord has given you the city? Joshua said that. Who said, by hearsay, I had heard of you, but now my eye has seen you? Job said that. Who said, how then could I do this great wrong and sin against God? Joseph said that. Who said, behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor. And I, if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. Who said that? Zacchaeus. Okay, so it was just a, a brief practical lesson on how to use the Bible. I believe for our next session, we're going to start um, understanding the different books in the Bible. So the sessions are, for our fifth lesson together, we're going to look at chapter six, which is the inspiration of scripture and the writing styles of the Bible. So today we talked about kind of how to access the scriptural texts and some basic differences of the Bible compared to other types of writing. Next week, we're going to look at what we mean when we say that scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we'll look at the different writing styles in it, poetry, mythology, letter, history, chronicle, laws, all those sorts of things. All right, great job today, sixth graders. I will see you next time, as soon as I figure out how to close. All right, take care and God bless.